Hello, science enthusiasts. I'm Jeff Connell, and today I invite you to join me in an exploration of evidence of a new planet in our solar system. In order to understand how scientists came up with the hypothesis of another planet out beyond Neptune, it might be useful to first take a short look back in history to see how we discovered the eight planets that we know exist today. The word planet comes from the ancient Greek phrase astedu planetes, which translates in English to wandering star. And when you view the planets in the sky, this phrase makes sense. Thousands of years ago, before the invention of telescopes, planets looked just like any other star in the sky, with the exception of one unique feature. From the observer's perspective, they appeared to wander across the sky. Their movements are almost imperceptible if you watch them for just a few minutes or even a few hours. But if you observe them over days and weeks, you'll notice that they appear to wander across the background star field, as if in an elegant dance with the rest of the sky. Now, although our ancient ancestors were able to identify these strange patterns, they didn't understand why they were occurring. Thousands of years ago, we possessed relatively limited scientific understanding of the world around us. So we tended to associate natural phenomena like rain, lightning, floods, winds, and even the movement of the planets across the sky as products of supernatural entities. In fact, 6,000 years ago, the Sumerian civilization called the planet Mercury Enki, who in their time was the god of water, fertility, and knowledge. The planet Venus was known as Inanna, the goddess of love and war. Mars was Gugulana, a deity whose mere footsteps would cause violent ground shaking. Jupiter was known as Enlu, the god of wind and storms. And Saturn was Ninurta, the god of agriculture. The Sumerians believed that their role in this world was to serve their gods, and so they devoted much of their time attempting to gain favor from them through worship, prayer, and even sacrifice. So, for instance, if their crops weren't doing so well, they might offer a sacrifice to the planet Saturn, the god of agriculture. If a young man was in search of a mate, he might pray to Venus, the goddess of love. If a couple became interested in starting a family, they might try to gain favor by praying to Mercury, the god of fertility. While the Sumerians were the first culture we know of to have given names to the planets, the Babylonians, who existed a thousand years later, were the first to apply scientific methods to the observation of planets. As far back as 5,000 years ago, the Babylonian scribes recorded the locations of each of the planets in the night sky. They recorded this information on clay tablets, which they then organized into monthly reports so they could be referenced in the future. This particular tablet, called the Venus Tablet of Amisaduka, is the oldest surviving astronomical text. This amazing clay record pinpoints the position of Venus in the sky dating back to over 5,000 years ago. The first models of our solar system were geocentric, meaning that the Earth was at the center of the universe and also the solar system. 2,500 years ago, Greek philosopher Anaximander proposed the first drawing of our solar system. It contained a cylindrical Earth in the center, surrounded by air, and encased in a series of rotating spheres containing holes. The purpose of these holes was to allow light to shine through from the outer rim of fire, so they believed the stars were simply lights shining through these holes. 100 years later, Aristotle proposed another geocentric model that contained a spherical non-rotating Earth at the center and the sun, moon, and planets and stars all revolving around it. One interesting note here, around the same time that Aristotle proposed his model, another astronomer and mathematician named Aristarchus proposed a model which correctly placed the sun at the center and had all the planets and the moon revolving around the sun. But his model was disregarded because philosophers cited that if it were true, then we would all feel the motion of the planet spinning and moving through space. 
But philosophers and astronomers also realized that Aristotle's model didn't accurately reflect apparent motion of the planets in the sky. The biggest problem was that the outer planets appeared to stop, then move backwards in retrograde motion for a period of time, and then continue forward again. Aristotle's model could not explain this motion. 500 years later, in the first century, Greek mathematician, astronomer, and geographer Claudius Ptolemy attempted to build a model that could correct for this retrograde phenomena. He developed a model where planets moved in flat helical coils around a circle around the Earth. And at this point in history, his model did an adequate job of predicting the observational movement of these heavenly bodies. And so Ptolemy's model would become the widely accepted model of our solar system for the next 1400 years. It wasn't until 1543 that the heliocentric model of our solar system was finally reintroduced by Nicholas Copernicus. Now his model correctly placed the sun at the center of the solar system with all the planets orbiting the sun. His model was simple, it was elegant, and it was much more accurate at predicting where planets, the moon, and the sun would be in the sky at any point in the future. And most importantly, it corrected for the retrograde motion of the planets, which Ptolemy's model had a hard time with. Now, while Copernicus is credited in transforming astronomy into a legitimate science, it was Italian astronomer, physicist, and engineer Galileo Galilei, who revolutionized astronomy with the invention of the telescope in 1609. When Galileo pointed the first telescope to the heavens, he observed details never seen before by humans. Imagine the surprise and wonderment of astronomers of that era. Consider that before this crucial invention, the planets were thought to be stars. The Milky Way was thought to be a milky road that traversed the sky for some unknown scientific reason. The moon and sun were thought to be perfectly smooth. With Galileo's new invention, he discovered that the moon's surface is actually rough with mountains and craters. He discovered the sun is marked with imperfections, what we call sunspots today. And he discovered that Jupiter was not a star-like pinpoint of light, but rather it was a sphere like the Earth and it possessed its own moons. He discovered that Venus displayed moon-like phases, and he saw that the Milky Way was not a road made of milk, but rather a concentrated region of countless individual stars. Galileo's discoveries offered mankind a new window through which we could actually see the solar system and understand our place in it. Over the next century, telescopes became larger and larger, and with these increases, our understanding of the universe expanded as well. In 1781, our seventh planet, Uranus, was discovered by British astronomer William Herschel, who, while performing a survey of the stars, noticed a very faint object only barely above the limit of the visibility of the eye. The object appeared to move in front of the fixed stars, demonstrating that it was closer to us than the stars. At first he thought he found a comet, but later he determined it was a new planet in orbit around the sun, the first new planet discovered since ancient times. And 20 years later, Italian astronomer Giuseppe Piazzi and German astronomer Heinrich Olbers discovered asteroids Ceres and Pallas, which were initially classified as new planets until Herschel, now one of the most eminent astronomers of his day, convinced the scientific community that these rocks were too small to be planets and that they should be classified separately. So he came up with the term asteroid, and from this point on, in 1802, we had a distinction between planets and asteroids. While Uranus was discovered through the process of charting stars, Neptune was discovered in a completely different way. In 1820, French astronomer Alexis Bouvard was tracking the position of Uranus as it crossed the sky, when he noticed that it didn't orbit the sun quite the way the mathematical predictions indicated that it should. The prediction tables for Jupiter and Saturn always worked out perfectly, but for some reason, Uranus was not following the same rules. At points in its orbit around the sun, it appeared to be moving too fast, and at other times, it appeared to be moving too slow. It was as if some strange force was tugging and pulling at Uranus. So Bavard came up with a hypothesis that the irregularities might be caused by the influence of a giant planet just beyond the orbit of Uranus. 
1846, another French astronomer, Urban Le Verrier, worked through the complicated math of where a planet might be that could cause the irregularities in Uranus's orbit. And he sent these predictions to the Berlin Observatory. And that very same night, astronomer Johann Gall pointed his telescope to the location Le Verrier predicted, and he discovered Neptune. Le Verrier became so famous from this incredible discovery that utilized math, many astronomers try to reproduce his results in an attempt to further predict new planets out beyond Neptune. The most famous of these predictions was by American businessman, author, mathematician, and astronomer Percival Lowell in 1905. Lowell believed that Uranus and Neptune were being displaced from their predicted positions by the gravity of yet another yet-to-be-discovered planet. In 1906, he hired a team of human computers led by Elizabeth Williams to calculate the predicted regions for the proposed planet. Lowell searched for the planet until his death in 1916. But in 1930, 23-year-old American astronomer Clyde Tombaugh working at the Lowell Observatory, discovered Pluto near the location predicted by Lowell. So everyone initially assumed it was the planet that Lowell had predicted. However, in 1978, Pluto's mass was calculated, and it turned out its mass is thousands of times too small to have any effect on the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. Additionally, we now know that the discrepancies between the predicted and observed positions of Uranus and Neptune were not caused by the gravity of an unknown planet. Rather, they were due to an incorrect value for the mass of Neptune. And Voyager 2's encounter with Neptune in 1989 yielded a more accurate value of its mass, and the orbital discrepancies disappear using this value. What Pluto did become was a dwarf planet. In August 2006, the International Astronomical Union revised its definition of a planet. There are now three criteria that must be met for an object to be called a planet. In Pluto's case, it meets the first two criteria, but not the third. It hasn't cleared or absorbed the other objects located in the neighborhood of its orbit. So Pluto has joined the list of objects of what are now called dwarf planets. And as of today, the International Astronomical Union recognizes five dwarf planets in our solar system. They are Eris, Pluto, Makemake, Haumea, and Ceres. Here's the current list of planets and dwarf planets in order of their distance from the Sun. Note that Ceres is the only dwarf planet located between Mars and Jupiter in a region of the solar system called the Asteroid Belt. Pluto, Haumea, Makemake, and Eris, on the other hand, are all located out beyond Neptune, and they're members of a separate belt called the Kuiper Belt. Gerard Kuiper first proposed the existence of a belt of objects orbiting the Sun out beyond Neptune because he believed it was the only explanation for the existence of short-term comets. And in 1992, after five years of scanning the sky, astronomers Dave Jewett and Jane Liu discovered the first Kuiper Belt object. And since 1992, astronomers have discovered over 3,000 objects in this region. The true total number of objects is probably closer to a million, so there's a lot of future discovering left to be done. In a previous video I titled Comets, Asteroids, and Meteors, I'll link that video below, I explained a region of our solar system called the Asteroid Belt and how scientists hypothesize that a planet would have formed there, but Jupiter's gravity prevented one from forming. Well, similar to Jupiter's relationship to the Asteroid Belt, the Kuiper Belt is influenced by Neptune. And as a result, most Kuiper Belt objects have one thing in common they're gravitationally tethered to Neptune. What does that mean? It means that at some point in the past, these objects got close to Neptune's gravity and they were swung into their current orbits. And because gravity is a conservative force, once it achieves a new orbit, it will always come back to the place where its orbit changed. And it will return to that same exact point indefinitely until and unless it's altered again by Neptune or another object. And because these initial handshakes all took place close to Neptune, these objects all will return to their initial meeting place once each and every orbit around the Sun. So while all these Kuiper Belt objects initially started from random points in our solar system, over billions of years, each of them shook hands with Neptune at some point and forever became a family member of the Kuiper Belt. 
So here's our solar system today. You can see the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and that little circle in the very center is the Earth and the Sun. And those yellow circles at the edge are these icy bodies in the Kuiper Belt. And each one is pushed and pulled by the gravitational field of Neptune in ways we can entirely predict. Okay, so now we understand everything in our solar system. No more mysterious wobbles, and everything is going around the sun exactly the way it's supposed to, right? Well, not quite. In 2003, American astronomer Mike Brown discovered this curious object. It was initially named 2003 BB12, and then later renamed to 90377 Sedna, or just Sedna for short. It's about a third of the size of Pluto. The curious thing about Sedna is that it has a highly elliptical orbit, but it never gets close to anything that would have seemed to have caused it. If it got close to Neptune at some point in its orbit around the Sun like this, then that would make sense. It would mean that it got really close to Neptune at some point in the past, and Neptune flung it way out there. But Sedna's closest approach to Neptune's orbit is more than twice the distance as Neptune is away from the Sun. Now, in astronomy, when you find one mystery like this, you study it, and if you don't have enough data to come up with a hypothesis for why it exists, you just move on. And this is exactly what Brown did. But then a decade later, in 2014, two American astronomers, Scott Shepard and Chad Trujillo, discovered Biden. Similar to Sedna, Biden has a very highly eccentric orbit, and its closest approach to the Sun is way out beyond the influence of Neptune. And around this same time period, astronomers began finding more of these curious objects. And when all of their orbits were cataloged and compared, a couple of peculiar features became evident. All of the objects had orbital planes that are aligned within a few degrees of each other, and all of the orbits are clustered on one side of our solar system. This really piqued the interest of Mike Brown, so he walked down the hall from his office at Caltech and showed his data to an associate, Constantine Batygin, whose scientific expertise focuses on the formation and evolution of planetary systems. And when Batygin saw the data, he was intrigued too. They needed to address the obvious question first. What if there are other objects out there that we just simply haven't discovered yet and are not in this cluster? That would make these objects less of a mind puzzle for sure. Fortunately, there are mathematical methods to calculate this statistical probability. And when they did the math, they calculated it out to 1 in 500. That would be like tossing a coin nine times in a row and getting heads each time. After reflecting on the low probability of chance, they raised another proposal. What if a star passed close to our solar system at some point in history, and the gravity of the star pulled these objects toward one side of the solar system? That would have worked again, except they determined that in order for the cluster to exist today, the star would have had to have passed our solar system really recently, like less than 100 million years ago. Otherwise, the orbits of these objects would have spread out again in random directions. And as it turns out, 100 million years is just too short a period of time, because the star would have had many more side effects on our solar system that we just don't see today. So next, they explored the possibility that the overall mass of the Kuiper Belt might be causing this clustering effect. For instance, let's say if the mass of undiscovered objects in the Kuiper Belt were aligned in a certain way and their mass was sufficient, it would have this effect. However, when they calculated the mass required to cause this effect, it far exceeded the known mass of the Kuiper Belt by a factor of 10,000. And at this point, Brown and Batygin, only after exhausting all reasonable explanation, decided to consider the possibility of the existence of another planet. The math for determining the mass is pretty straightforward, and they were able to calculate that the planet would have to be about six times the mass of the Earth, and the orbit would have to be highly eccentric, similar to the clustered object. But where would they place it in the solar system model to cause the effect of the clustered objects? Supercomputers are perfectly designed for this type of problem solving. And one of the nice things about working at Caltech is that they own their own supercomputer. So they put this computer to work running four and a half billion year simulations of our solar system. At the time our solar system was initially forming, the Kuiper belt would have been much more or less organized. In fact, it would not have been a belt at all. 
objects would have been spread out through our solar system randomly. So using this as a starting point, they ran simulation after simulation, changing the variables slightly each iteration until a simulation produced the clustering of objects that we see today. And in their final simulation, you can see at about two and a half billion years into the life of our solar system, right about here, a couple of patterns begin to form. First, the Kuiper belt is tightening up into a more compressed band. This is due to the interactions with Neptune. Second, you begin to see the clustering of the most distant objects on one side of the solar system in anti-alignment with the hypothesized planet 9. Just by itself, the simulation is pretty incredible in the degree that it lends support for the existence of a planet beyond Neptune. But what's more amazing is that it explains some other mysteries about our solar system. The most significant of these mysteries is the tilt of the sun with respect to the rest of the planets. It's tilted by about six degrees. Now this doesn't seem like a lot, but the reason for the sun's tilt has always been a mystery. Elizabeth Bailey, a graduate student at Caltech, calculated the dynamic and evolutionary influence of a planet placed in the exact location proposed by Brown and Batygin. And the math shows that over a four and a half billion year period, again, the approximate age of our solar system, the planet would shift the orbital planes of the rest of the planets by approximately six degrees. This means it's not the sun that's tilted, it's the rest of the planet's orbital planes that become tilted due to the influence of planet 9. And lastly, the computer simulation model showed why some extremely distant objects orbit the sun perpendicular to our solar system and why some Kuiper Belt objects have highly inclined orbits. So what proposals have Brown and Batygin presented concerning planet 9? Well, it's about six times the mass of the Earth. It would be the fifth largest planet in our solar system, so it's really big. If you placed it next to Neptune and the Earth, it would be somewhere in between. Its orbit looks something like this. It takes 10 to 20,000 years to go around the Sun, and its most likely location in the sky is somewhere between the constellations Orion and Taurus. So what's the general scientific consensus or acceptance of a potentially new planet out there beyond Neptune? Well, if you ask Brown and Batygin, they'll tell you that they are 99.9% .9 sure that Planet Nine exists. Now, good scientists will tell you that you need to guard heavily against confirmation bias when you're doing research. This is a real psychological effect that exists in all of us that can lead us to look only for evidence that confirms what we already believe, to consciously or unconsciously look only for evidence that confirms our personal bias, while discounting or ignoring evidence that supports an alternate view. Now, examining Brown and Batygin's research, they began first by trying to disprove the existence of a new planet. So they did try to avoid the effect of confirmation bias. Some scientists have suggested that perhaps the object is not a planet, but rather a primordial black hole. Primordial black holes are predicted to have popped into existence within the first fractions of a second after the Big Bang. If this mysterious object is actually a black hole, it would be pretty small, about the size of a baseball. Other scientists have argued that these uniquely clustered objects may not be as unique as we think they are. Maybe we're just not looking closely enough at the rest of the sky. Bottom line, without a smoking gun picture of the planet, the astronomical community isn't going to be fully swayed by the existence of Planet Nine. So where are we today with regards to finding concrete evidence of Planet Nine? Well, Mike Brown is devoting a lot of his time trying to find the planet. With the approval of the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, Brown has been borrowing time on this giant 8.2 meter optical infrared telescope located at the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. The reason why he's using this particular telescope and not the larger 10.4 meter telescope actually owned by Caltech right next door is that the Subaru telescope is equipped with the world's most powerful wide field imaging camera which has an 870 megapixel image sensor. What's special about this camera is that it's capable of viewing a large portion of the sky at a very high resolution. This allows Brown to survey large swaths of the sky much faster than with conventional telescope cameras. It also improves the capability of finding very faint objects. To give you an idea of how efficient this is, it took the Hubble Space Telescope about 10 years to spot 50 supernova located more than 8 billion light years away. 
the Subaru telescope found 58 distant supernova in five years. Because Planet 9 is theorized to be so far away, and because the Subaru telescope has a busy schedule with other observational science requirements, Brown has only surveyed 25% of the portion of the sky where he believes Planet 9 to be located. It will take another few years to survey the complete area. In addition to Brown's efforts, a lot of citizen astronomers have been looking and continue to look for this planet. Imagine the notoriety an astronomer would receive if they were the first to discover this planet. There are also decades of night sky imagery already on file so there's another initiative to put computer software to work sifting through this imagery to see if we can find this planet. Unfortunately, computers are not yet the best resource for detecting differences in imagery patterns. In fact, the best resource we have for this task is humans. So there's yet another initiative being run by an organization called Zooniverse. You don't need any specialized background, training, or expertise to participate. In fact, you can contribute to the search using your own computer at your own convenience. Here's how it works. Zooniverse shoots you several images of the sky, a tiny, tiny portion of the larger area of the sky where Planet Nine is theorized to be. The images represent photos taken over several days of that tiny area of sky. Since stars are stationary relative to each other, they don't change position between these photos. But if you find an object that appears to be moving through the star field, you can mark it and report it back to the Planet Nine research team where they will publish the location to the astronomical community who will in turn point telescopes to that area of the sky and see if they can find it. Now, any object that you find could be Planet Nine or it could be an asteroid, another trans-Neptunian object, a dwarf planet, or even a comet. So even if you don't discover Planet Nine, you may be the first to discover a new object never seen before. And remember, at this point in time, humans still outperform computers by far when it comes to detecting pattern changes. So you could really be the person to make a big discovery. If you're really good at those spot the difference between these two photo type social media memes, you might be highly suited for this effort. I'll place the link to this project below if you want to give it a try. With all of these efforts occurring simultaneously, Brown bets that within the next couple of years, some astronomer somewhere in this world will find a faint point of light moving slowly across the sky and announce the discovery of a new and quite possibly not the last planet in our solar system. Okay, that's all I have today, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. If there are areas of the universe you would like me to explore, let me know in the comments section below. Please share this episode with your friends and family if you think it's educational. Click the little alarm bell if you would like to be notified of my next episode. And lastly, stay safe out there, friends.